This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 20, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 10. Salvation, Implications, and Responsibilities of Salvation. Hi, well, my, welcome back. My name is Herb Bateman. And uh, we are in the midst of working our way through the general letters, as you are probably aware. Um, we spent um, uh, time talking about three general letters that were written to uh, Jewish believers, um, predominantly Jewish believers, if not all Jewish believers. James, writing to the Jews in the Diaspora. Jude, his brother, writing to the Jews in Judea during a time of conflict. And then we looked at the author of Hebrews. We looked at the book of Hebrews, writing to Hebrew Christians living in Rome. Um, the next group of uh, general letters are written to uh, uh, audiences that are generally considered to be mixed audience of both Jew and Gentile. So as we move into the, um, the last... Uh, group of letters, the next um, five, they are letters that are written to um, uh, a mixed audience. First Peter, Second Peter, uh, and the Johannine letters, the three Johannine letters. Today we're going to look at one Peter, first Peter, and uh, typically uh, first Peter is a message from God uh, to his chosen people describing for them, their new life in, in Jesus, uh, the Messianic Son of Promise, and detailing what it means for them both now and in the future. Um, it is, a, um, it is a, um, an admonition for ethical living um, with commands that are describing in great theological detail what it means to be um, the elect and how election should uh, drive the way in which they live day in and day out for Jesus in order to fulfill God's plan. So as we think about Peter, um, we need to keep that in mind. And, and one of the things about um, Peter is that um, it is a, a book that is dealing with how do we live life when we're in the midst of suffering. Um, so um, with that in mind, let's go ahead and um, begin our uh, our um, walk through Peter. And um, let's begin with the salutation. Uh, once again, this is a letter, so it has a, an opening and closing salutation. And uh, the, the salutation is seen or presented in the first two verses of uh, his letter. From Peter, an apostle of Jesus, who is the Christ, to those temporarily residing abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by being set apart by the Spirit for obedience and for sprinkling with Jesus the Messiah's blood, who is the Messiah's blood, by grace and peace be yours in full measure. Now, Peter is a Greek name um, that in Aramaic means stone. Uh, there is no one else in the New Testament called Peter. He's the, the only one named as being Peter. Um, and you see Peter calling himself and referencing himself as an apostle. Now, this is the first time in the general letters that the, the idea uh, of an author identifying himself as apostle. James didn't do it. Jude doesn't do it. Of course, the author of Hebrews has no salutation. And of course, when you get the Johannine letters, he describes himself as elder. So when you come to the Petrine letters, Peter is the only one who, who references himself as an apostle. And of course, an apostle is a technical term for, uh, for uh, one who sees himself as being sent. Um, we saw the term used of Jesus in the book of Hebrews in chapter 2, now where Jesus uh, was an appointed apostle, and it's the only place in the New Testament where uh, Jesus is even called an apostle. Uh, but here we have this word being used of Peter, and it's a technical, it's a technical term uh, that speaks about someone who's been sent out. 
um, he writes um, to uh, the chosen. And um, once again, uh, this idea of chosen, uh, in a Jewish context, uh, of course, you're going to have to qualify what that means. Like they had to do with Jude and had to be done with um, um, in uh, James, because all Jews considered themselves chosen. Here, because of the mixed audience, um, uh, chosen isn't being qualified like in those epistles. But here, uh, to the chosen sojourners, uh, the idea of being uh, resident aliens, and, and Peter is trying to emphasize the fact that um, though you may be living in this Greco-Roman world, um, this, this is, uh, we are just uh, sojourners in this world. And, um, and uh, but, uh, and they're, they're uh, living in various places dispersed throughout um, northern Galilee, or northern Galatia, I'm sorry, uh, north Galatia, which would be uh, modern Turkey today, the north part of modern Turkey. Um, he also recognizes uh, these um, folks as being those who live as chosen ones um, uh, based upon the foreknowledge of God. And, um, and so we've got this idea that the basis upon which they are, they are the, those who live as chosen ones is based upon God's fore, foreknowledge, that is, he, he foreknew them uh, before uh, uh, their, uh, they knew um, of themselves uh, being part of God's chosen family. And it's by means of uh, the sanctifying work uh, that they have been foreknown. They have been foreknown by means of sanctifying work because, once again, God, in his uh, uh, planning and big picture of Scripture, set into motion this plan to reestablish his kingdom rule on earth and to redeem a people to enter into that kingdom. And he set into motion this plan, and he knows exactly where he's going. And he knew exactly who it was who was going to fulfill that plan. And so within God's foreknowledge, he knew that um, men and women were going to be sanctified through the work of Jesus, his messianic son. So we have this uh, opening salutation where the apostle writes to Christians scattered throughout Asia Minor uh, and, um, and encloses these, these verses uh, with, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Um, after this um, first two verses, uh, Peter moves into a, um, a section of praise. Verses uh, 3 through 12, uh, Peter uh, gives praise to God. And he gives praise to God for several things. And we're going to look through uh, each one of these. Uh, one uh, aspect of praise concerns God's uh, great mercy. Uh, another thing that uh, Peter praises God for is the inexpressible joy uh, Christians now have because of their knowledge of Jesus, who is uh, Messiah. And then finally, uh, there is God is praised for the greatness of the messianic salvation that um, these followers of Jesus are now experiencing. So we want to look at each one of these uh, in chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. And we're going to, we're going to be beginning, uh, this is this whole section, we can just label it as um, praise, praises to God for calling Christians to a truly great and complete salvation. And the first thing he's praised for, the first thing that Peter gives God prays for is his great mercy. And let's read and um, hear what uh, Peter has to say in verses 3 to 5. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, who is the Christ. By his great mercy, he gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus, who is the Christ. That is, into an inheritance imperishable and undefiled and unfading. It is reserved in heaven for you, who, 
by God's power are protected through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So here we have um, Peter calling his readers uh, to, to, uh, to um, bless uh, God, uh, particularly blessing God for uh, their living hope, uh, their um, salvation uh, that they have, which is a, a hope. Now when we think about hope in this context, by his great mercy he gave us new birth into a living hope. This is not, well, something I hope for. It is an, it's an objective thing that you can count on. Now, in Hebrews, it was interesting that when the author of Hebrews talks about hope at one point in the letter, he talks about hope, how it entered beyond or on the other side of the veil on the Holy of Holies. And so hope becomes personified as that to that which resided in the, in, in, on that other side of that veil. And then Jesus is seen as also entering into that other side of the veil as the, you know, merging the two ideas. Jesus is our hope. It is objective. We can count on it. It is part, Jesus is the man through whom God has completed his program. So this hope we have great mercy in, he gave us new birth into a living hope through what? Through Jesus, who is the Messiah. So we have um, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. And, um, and when we think about uh, this uh, idea of blessing God and Father, we bless him for that living hope in, uh, through the resurrection of Jesus. We also are blessing because of we've, been, uh, we've entered into an imperishable and unfading inheritance. Um, unlike the inheritance that uh, the Jewish people might experience with regards to entering in the land, which was just temporal and fleeting, this inheritance that we are experiencing is not fleeting. It is eternal. Uh, this hope will pre be preserved uh, until we receive our inheritance. And then uh, he moves to... Um, verse 5 in talking about uh, blessing the Father uh, because he's, not only has he given us um, uh, living hope, not only are we uh, looking forward to an imperishable, undefined, unfading inheritance, but we also are looking for that final salvation. Three good reasons to bless God, our hope our inheritance, and our final salvation. So God is to be praised for his great mercy in bringing followers of Jesus into this new life, this, uh, this living hope, this secure inheritance, uh, and culminating in a final salvation. Then he moves into discussing um, and praising God for the in inexpressible joy that we have. Um, we read about this inexpressible joy in verses 6 to 9. In verse 6, we read, this brings you great joy. What brings you great joy? Well, he's, he's already told us the things that God has blessed us with. Uh, the blessing of hope the, uh, through Jesus' resurrection, the inheritance, and uh, the future salvation. These three things bring us, bring believers, great joy. Although you, have, you, although you may have to suffer for a short time in various trials. Such trials show the proven character of your faith, which is much more valuable than gold. Gold that is tested by fire, even though it is uh, passing away. And will bring praise and glory and honor when Jesus, who is the Christ, is revealed. You have not seen him, but you love him. You do not see him now, but you believe in him. And so you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy because you are attaining the goal of your faith, namely the salvation of your souls. So here we have this uh, 
inexpressible joy that is being um, focused upon uh, that uh, that brings joy. Now he talks about in verse um, six um, about trials, and um, I think it's important to recognize that trials are necessary for for the Christian. Um, in Hebrews, uh, the author of Hebrews in chapter 12 talks about the importance of education to, uh, to help us mature, to grow, uh, God bringing things into our lives that enable to, um, to uh, help us advance in our maturity as a family member uh, in God's community. Here, the idea of trials are necessary for Christians, and God uses them to perfect us. Uh, this idea of, of uh, trials is also seen in James as well as being a way of perfecting. Um, but they can, if we don't keep the right perspective, rob us of joy. Um, and Peter wants to remind them to keep the trials that they are experiencing, keep, it, keep them in perspective. Um, they are necessary. It is necessary uh, to suffer distress uh, in, in various kinds of troubles, uh, but it's with an intention. Um, the, uh, the intention is to, to, uh, for the, uh, the genuineness of our faith, the faith of the believer, might rise to the surface. Trials do to faith what fire does to gold. It purifies. And so we've got this expectation of, uh, of uh, trials uh, purifying us uh, to show our proven character and faith. Then um, he talks about that, um, and it's uh, that um, these trials are to uh, praise and, and, and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. Uh, we might be found um, to uh, praise and glory and honor uh, in Jesus, when Jesus is revealed. Um, and so we have this, uh, ultimately, we're going to obtain full salvation of our souls as the process as we work through these trials. So God is to be praised for the inescapable joy that, that followers of Jesus now have, knowing that Jesus Christ personally, by faith and in spite of present trials, which brings out our genuine faith. It helps that, that cream rise to the, to the top uh, and that our character might be proven. It's easy to go through life. If everything is hunky-dory and we don't have any experience, our character doesn't come through. But it's when, it's when those tough times come and those pressures are there and those tensions are there, how to respond to those, those, those times. Um, uh, do we have that mind of Jesus? Do we, do, uh, do we have that uh, wherewithal to, in the, in, in the heat of the moment, the manifest Christian character? Um, Peter's going to talk about in a few minutes, we'll get to it soon, um, the responsibility of the believer. Um, and, of course, these are responsibilities that we're to have uh, in the midst of trials, um, but we'll be there soon. We'll get there in a minute. The third thing that uh, God is to be praised for is for the greatness of, of the uh, messianic salvation in verses 10 through 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who predicted the grace that would come to you searched and investigated carefully. They, they probed into what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when, they, when he testified beforehand about the sufferings appointed for the Christ and his subsequent joy. They were shown that they were serving not themselves but you in regard to the things now announced to you through those who evangelized you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things angels long to catch a glimpse of. So here we have this concern of salvation, of salvation that was uh, uh, prophesied, told in advance years ago uh, in the Old Testament. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that when the prophets spoke in the Old Testament uh, that um, 
there's a, a this equals that mentality. There's a, there's a progress of revelation that exists between the Old Testament and the New. It's not that the New Testament says, it's not that, it's not that the New Testament's creating something different, totally out of sync with what the Old Testament is, but there are, there are ambiguities in the Old Testament prophets about things that are yet to come that God fills in the blanks as time goes on. So the, so the prophets spoke about things in the future, though not all things were known to the prophets at that time. There, there, are, there are ambiguities in what prophets say here that God fulfills and yet fills in the gaps to complete and, and reveal a progressive program uh, concerning us and our relationship with him and how it fits into his kingdom program and redeeming a people to, to enter into that kingdom. So he wants his readers to remember that um, uh, uh, salvation included suffering as well as glory. It included suffering as well as glory. Um, that, um, that the grace would come to, to them. Uh, grace that prom God promised uh, be, uh, to, uh, to believers generally included Gentiles. I think sometimes we forget that as well. And remember, he's writing to a mixed audience. And it was always in God's purview that um, salvation be extended to, to Gentiles in the Old Testament. Uh, we see that with just the building of the temple and uh, Solomon's prayer of dedication and this idea that God made this temple uh, draw people to you. May they come to know you and worship you at this temple that, and that they might be a people that would live in a way that would draw people to want to know the one true God. And of course, we have stories like Jonah who, who doesn't want to go to the Gentiles, but God sends them there anyway, and there is a, a repentance and, a, and obviously a concern that God has for the Gentiles. God has always had a concern for the Gentiles. And so he wants to talk about, and he's bringing in the fact that salvation was not just limited to the Jew, but was extended and meant to be for all people, uh, and that has come to fruition through Jesus. The prophets... Uh, uh, didn't fully understand how this was to work, but they did understand that not all of their inspired revelations would be filled in their own day. So though they saw things and God told them things in their day, they didn't always necessarily expect a, a full, complete fulfillment of those things. And a perfect example would be Daniel. Uh, and um, and uh, there was not a uh, necessarily uh, an expectation. He would see all that things that God was telling him fulfilled in his day. So we have this uh, God being praised for the great messianic uh, salvation message that was foretold in the prophets and fulfilled in the messianic son of promise, Jesus. Now having, uh, having uh, talked about and discussed um, uh, the praise for God, praising God for three things, um, praising him for um, his great mercy, praising him for the inexpressible joy that we have through our salvation, and praising him for the, for the great um, uh, revealing of his plan through the Messianic Son. Uh, the um, author, Peter, now moves to the body of the letter where he discusses and declares the true grace of God, the true grace of God. And this section, he is going to uh, look at uh, privileges and responsibilities. Uh, chapter 1, verse 13, um, uh, actually goes to uh, 511. And we're just going to look at the first portion of this. Um, we'll pick up uh, uh, the other aspects of uh, salvific blessings and responsibilities later on. But what we're going to look at now uh, in our immediate uh, presence is Christians and their privileged, uh, our privileges as children of God. And um, how it is that as children of God, we are to grow in spiritual maturity. 
So we're going to look first at um, uh, Christians and their responsibility, the Christian's responsibility to cultivate a lifestyle of hope and holiness. The responsibility that, that believers have, followers of Jesus, uh, the Messiah, uh, as part of God's messianic program. How is it or what is it that we are to do to cultivate a lifestyle of hope and holiness. And we read in chapter 1, verse 13 to 16, the following. Therefore, get your minds ready for action. So it begins in the mind. Get your minds ready for action. How? How are we supposed to get our minds ready? Well, he tells us, by being fully sober and set your hope completely on the grace that will be brought to you when Jesus, who is the Christ, is revealed. So he's telling us, prepare yourselves for action. Uh, gird up the loins of your mind, if you please. Uh, be self-controlled. Set your, set your hope completely on Jesus, who bought you, who paid the price for you, who ransomed you. Uh, so we have right from the very get-go the main duty of a believer, the main duty of someone who chooses to follow Jesus. It is to be so conscious of the culmination of our hope in, in, in the return of Jesus that we, we focus all our attention on him. Prepare yourself for action. And then he moves to verse 14, like obedient children. So now we move into a comparison. You are to, you are to get yourself ready uh, and get your minds ready for action by being like obedient children. Do not comply with the evil urges you used to follow in your ignorance. In contrast to these following these evil urges, he, he, he's, he's expecting that followers be like the Holy One who called you. Become holy yourselves in all your conduct. So in, in contrast to um, uh, following old urges, he's encouraging to uh, be like the Holy One, to be like God in the manner in which uh, they conduct themselves. For it's written, and now he's going to appeal to Scripture, you shall be holy. Why? Because I am holy. So we have this... Uh, to be like obedient children uh, and not following and doing things that we used to do, but we are to be holy in the manner in which we conduct ourselves. We are to be like God in the way that we, we live. So we have this uh, expectation to cultivate a lifestyle of hope and holiness. Um, from here, he moves into um, cultivating uh, a lifestyle of reverence for God. A reverence for God. Um, verses uh, 17 to 21, uh, we see that focus. And if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, live as out the time of your temporary residence here in reverence. So here we have uh, this, uh, uh, this idea that we, uh, since we do, it's assuming this is, a, you know, uh, this is an argument uh, based upon an assumption. We do call God as our Father. So since we do call God our Father, uh, you address God as Father, the one who is impartial in the way in which he deals with our, our, our lives, live out the time of your temporary residence here in reverence. So there's this expectation that um, as we um, think about our responsibilities to God, we are to consider God as reverent. Now, in the, in the previous discussion, we were looking at our responsibilities as it concerned um, Believers, uh, our responsibilities uh, um, as um, believe uh, as uh, uh, to God. Here we're talking about 
uh, a responsibility to God for uh, reverence. So let me, uh, let me go back, because I, I don't want to um, lose you, uh, because I just got tongue-tied. We first begin with cultivating a um, lifestyle of hope and holiness, and that in involves obedience. And now we're talking about a lifestyle of reverence to God in verse 17. And then he gives a reason why. He tells us why it is that we need to be cultivating this reverence for God. And it says in verse, seven, in verse um, 18, because you know that from your empty way of life inherited from your ancestors, you were ransomed, not by perishable things like silver or gold, but by the precious blood like that of an unblemished blemish, blemished and spotless lamb, namely the Messiah. So he says we're to live a life of reverence, and he provides the reason why. It's because uh, we know that we were deemed from our, a futile way of life, a life that we inherited from our parents. Uh, and, of course, he's talking to a mixed audience of Jew and Gentile in, in uh, northern Galatia. And, um, and, this, uh, and he's, actually, he's challenging their culture in some ways, in the way in which they lived uh, culturally. Uh, a lifestyle, a uh, culture that was handed down from your forefathers. Uh, you know, I, and I like the idea of this, of this thinking of this culturally because we're going to see that Paul, Peter later on in chapter 3 is going to challenge some cultural things. And as a, as a, as a believer, um, we are um, new creatures who, are, who have been brought into a new kingdom. Uh, Paul talks about it as being citizens of, of uh, uh, not a Philippi, but a, citizen, a heavenly citizenship. Um, we, are, uh, we belong to a different culture. We belong to a, a heavenly culture that, that demands a different uh, uh, expectations, different responsibilities. And uh, so, Paul, uh, so Peter is uh, talking about our responsibilities to God as concerning um, uh, obedience and also reverence. And we have this reverence. We are to have this uh, sense of reverence because we've been purchased with something extremely precious. Um, not uh, bulls, the blood of bulls and goats, but by or through the blood of Jesus. And so he, he's talking about the preciousness of the blood of the Messianic Son. Uh, it's like that of a sacrificial lamb without blemish and fault, faultless, um, but it's better than that. Um, on the one hand, he was foreknown, um, appointed, designated um, before the creation of the world for that task. And we've already talked about this. In God's program, in his big picture, when we think about that program of God, God sets into motion this plan to reestablish his kingdom rule on earth and redeem a people to enter that kingdom. This is all part of God's plan. And though it's revealed to us as people in parts, um, Jesus knew ahead of time, he knew ahead of time who it was that was going to fulfill that kingdom program. Who, that is the Christ, that is Jesus, on the one hand was foreknown before the creation of the world, but on the other hand, who has appeared at the last of times, these last times, in this present era, So, there we are to conf, conf, uh, cultivate a uh, life of reverence for God because of what he's done through his messianic son of promise. We move on from here to Christians cultivating a lifestyle of reverence to Christians um, cultivating a lifestyle of brotherly love. 
Um, and when I, I want to make sure we keep this, uh, it, we're to cultivate these lifestyles, but I want to make sure we don't lose sight of the fact that it's a responsibility. Uh, we are to cultivate um, these, um, these things because um, it is our responsibility to do so. We are responsible. It is our responsibility to cult cultivate a lifestyle of hope and holiness. It's our lifestyle to cultivate a lifestyle of reverence to God. It's our responsibility to cultivate a lifestyle of brotherly love. And I, I'm emphasizing responsibility because we live in a period of time today where no one wants to accept responsibility for anything. It's always someone else's fault. Um, uh, as a, a faculty member, as a prof, um, I can't tell you how many times I would hear, I didn't learn the material because you didn't teach it to me in class. No, there's some things I can't teach you in class. It's your responsibility to study outside class so that you can get a handle on this and to uh, put into practice the things I'm trying to teach. Um, if you don't practice, if you don't memorize, that, that's something I can't do in the classroom. That's your responsibility. It's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to give you the tools, to give you directions, to point you in that right direction. Your responsibility is to get going, to act on the things that I share with you and, and, and directions that I give you. Um, um, we tend not to accept responsibilities uh, for our failings. Peter's making it really clear to us that we as believers, we who claim to follow Jesus, we have responsibilities. A responsibility to, um, um, uh, to be hopeful, a responsibility to, to reverent God, and a responsibility to love other followers of Jesus. And we see this in verses 22 through 25 of chapter 1. You have purified your souls by obeying the truth with this intention, to show sincere mutual love. So love one another earnestly from a pure heart. You have been born anew, not from perishable, but from imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory, like the flower of the grass, the grass withers and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So get rid of all the evil and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. And yearn like newborn infants for pure spiritual milk so that you may have you may grow up to salvation if you've experienced the Lord's kindness. So we have in these verses, verses 22 um, through 25, and I read a little bit too far, um, he makes a, um, again, uh, assumes um, for the sake of argument something to be true. You have been purified. Your souls have been purified. And purification has happened by obedience to the truth, um, it's, uh, which this, this uh, obedience to truth is with a specific view in mind. What is in view in mind as we have this obedience to the truth is to um, be able to practice pure uh, brotherly love loving one another fervently. Um, this is going to be a theme that's going to be uh, prominent later on in, a, in some subsequent books uh, uh, at, the, um, at the close of our discussions on the general letters. Um, and the reason is that we've been born again. We have, we have a new life uh, in Messiah. And it's not, um, it's not through... Um, uh, a perishable seed that is conceived in the womb of a woman, but it's an imperishable. It is a, uh, a, a um, it's not from a perishable seed, but
but one that is imperishable, namely through the living and enduring word of God. We are, we are, we are new creatures in him. We are uh, new beings in him, not of the old created order, but of a, a new created order, an imperishable um, uh, creation. And then he talks about how humanity, our flesh, is like grass. It withers, it dries up, it dies. But as far as the word of God is concerned, it endures forever. And that word of God is what um, um, enables us to grow, to cultivate a lifestyle of brotherly love. Then he moves into talking about um, um, the need to, to nurture uh, a new life that's found um, in Jesus. Um, and this is found in verses, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And as he talks about um, Christians to nurture this new life founded in Christ, um, he begins by talking about us, uh, followers of Jesus as being children in God's family. Uh, and they're gr to grow up with regards to their um, 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 salvation. So the first thing we want to look at as we look at the nurturing of this new life, we want to look at it through the, uh, as though we are children uh, who, who grow up with regards to, uh, with respect to salvation. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. So get rid of all evil and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander and yearn like newborn infants for pure spiritual milk with this result. You may grow into your salvation. So he's talking about get rid of malice. Um, get rid of all types of deceit. Uh, th these, these are not uh, becoming of a, uh, of a person who is a child in the family of God. Um, grow up. Um, don't be hypocritical. Don't be envious. Uh, don't be slanderous. Um, these are things of uh, uh, that are, are not becoming of a, a newborn in God's uh, kingdom. We are to grow up. And we are to be like newborn babes, purely pure in our, in our lives for Jesus, in order that we might grow with respect to our salvation. Um, it is interesting that in verse 3, he talks about if you have experienced the Lord's kindness... Now, the word there, um, now I'm reading from the Net Bible, uh, but the word there is tasted. If you have tasted the Lord's kindness, um, that is if you've come to know the Lord's kindness. So this is the same word that um, Hebrews uses to talk about Jesus tasting death. Jesus knew death because he died in 2.9. Uh, this is the same word that talks about believers tasting um, the heavenly gift, knowing of the heavenly gift, of believers tasting the good works of God in 6.5. Here we have Peter using the same word to talk about tasting if you have tasted the Lord's kindness, the Lord's mercy, the Lord's grace. If you have tasted, if you've experienced um, this new birth, um, so he says, so that you may grow in salvation if you've tasted this new birth. Um, moving from um, looking at being children within God's family and being exhorted to grow up, um, Peter moves now to talking about as a spiritual house. Um, he moves from uh, the example of being like a child to being uh, a spiritual house and uh, being within a company of priests, verses 4 through 8. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. So as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but chosen and priceless in God's sight, you yourselves as living stones are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood and to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus, who is the Christ. 
For it says in Scripture, Look, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and priceless cornerstone, and whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. So you who believe see his value. But for those who do not believe, the, the stone that the builders rejected has, has become the cornerstone and a stumbling stone and a rock to trip over. They stumble. Why? Because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So now we're talking about uh, uh, Peter moves into this new life that's founded on Christ, moving beyond being a child to being a new building um, with, uh, within this uh, being founded in Christ, in, in Jesus. Um, and he talks about it in metaphorical language, as though they are stones being built. Uh, and, uh, and this is not unusual uh, to Peter. Um, we see this in other places as well, where people are seen as, as building, as houses. And so here we see the uh, believers, those who follow Jesus, as being seen as a, a building being built. And not only are they are building being built, but they are also priests. And I get this impression or this idea that, that they're, a, they're a temple as a community. They are a living temple and, as, and functioning as a temple as, and, and with, filled with priests that are part of this, this temple. And he, and he appeals to Scripture and talking about Jesus as being a cornerstone that was rejected. So, uh, and a, a stone that is a cornerstone that uh, was a stumbling block um, to be tripped over. Um, so we have, on the one hand, uh, a responsibility to grow as children, but we also have a responsibility to, um, uh, to um, see ourselves as a spiritual house, uh, functioning like priests within this house, and uh, perhaps maybe even suggesting to be um, sacrifices uh, uh, within this house on behalf of others. We're living stones, all being built as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So as a part of this spiritual house that we are a part of, we are to be offering spiritual sacrifices. And what are those things? Um, well, it involves brotherly love. It involves seeing God as reverent. It involves looking for this hope. Um, it involves um, um, living and offering ourselves to God on a, on a daily basis. For the scriptures uh, say, look, I lay in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, choice and precious, and the one who believes in it will never be put to shame a stone of stumbling. And what better way of stumbling over something than being self-sacrificing? Uh, the stone which the builders rejected, this one has become the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling which causes people to stumble, a, a rock of offense that raises opposition. Um, they stumble because they disobey. We are to be obedient in the way in which we live and offer ourselves sacrificially. Um, as um, members of this kingdom or this living house. And finally, um, the final responsibility we have as being members of this living house is to proclaim God's deeds um, widely uh, wherever we're at, verses 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, so that with this result, this purpose result, you may proclaim the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. You, were one, one, you once were not a people, but now you are God's people. You were shown, mercy, you were shown no mercy, but now you have received mercy." So here we have this expectation that you, that believers, followers of Jesus are to proclaim this message. Uh, since followers are considered a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of, of 
uh, God's own. Uh, all of that exists for this one purpose, that we proclaim God and what he's done. We are to proclaim this marvelous kingdom program that we have become part of. We are part of his kingdom who have been redeemed to work and operate within this kingdom as royal priests. As a royal priesthood. And so we go out from our kingdom uh, as members of this kingdom and to proclaim this message of God's kingdom. We were a people that once were not part of this kingdom, but we now are, and we should be willing to share um, that with others. Um, so all members of the church, all members of God's kingdom are expected to make these proclamations. Um, the highlighted difference of this high calling involves by contrasting what the readers were um, and what they had before their conversion, which was nothing. But now they have everything. And they've experienced the mercy of God, and God expects uh, believers um, to share that mercy. So we've moved through um, 1 Peter, um, looking at um, uh, an opening salutation that moves into uh, eventually moving into the joy that we have uh, as uh, members of this um, uh, new relationship with God into responsibilities that we have as um, followers of, uh, of Jesus and as a result of uh, God's work uh, established in the beginning, fulfilled now in Jesus, and we have been brought into this magnificent program. Next time we'll talk about uh, the rest of, uh, uh, we'll talk about our responsibility amongst ourselves as uh, people who follow Jesus. But in the meantime, I trust that um, you will take into consideration some of these responsibilities that we have. It's our responsibility to cultivate our lives for God. Have a great day. This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 20, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 10. Salvation, implications, and responsibilities of salvation. Mm -hmm.